Good morning and welcome to Burnfield Bible Church in beautiful Burnfield, California, right next to the Russian River. It's a beautiful, chilly morning, and we're all ready to go. We hope that you're ready to worship and also to hear God's word poured out before you. And we just pray that you can absorb those words into your heart and mind. Please join us as we begin. that are here, you're welcome to stand, sit, and move around however you feel comfortable. Jesus, let your kingdom come let your will be done. Let your glory reign, shining like the day. 
Well, good morning, everybody. I want to add my good morning to you. Uh, the good morning you just got from Faye and Randy. We're really glad to have them back with us um, this morning. Uh, don't have a lot of announcements um, as we're just starting to get back into being here uh, in our our building again. Uh, so we don't really have any announcements. But let me uh, let me read our scripture this morning. It's from Psalms 40, verses 4 and 5. How blessed is a man who has made the Lord his trust and has not turned to the proud nor to those who lapse into falsehood. Many, O Lord my God, are the wonders which you have done and your thoughts towards us. There is none to compare with you. If I would declare and speak of them, they would be too numerous to count. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning. We thank you that you've given us a chance to be here. And Lord, your blessings are too numerous for us to count. But Lord, we want to thank you for those blessings. Lord, we want to thank you for letting us be here or watching online or, or watching later, Lord. However, we are all together to worship you. You are the reason that we are here. And you are the reason, Lord, that we worship because you are the only one that is worthy of our worship. So, Lord, as we begin our service this morning, Lord, we invite you in. We want you to be the center of our attention this morning. Lord, we ask that every word that we sing, every word that we say this morning glorifies you. Lord, let this be about you this morning. And we pray all this in your name. Amen.
We are so blessed to be loved by such a good, good father. Yeah. To be unconditionally loved, protected. Sometimes, sometimes I learn. Only well, I've learned in my past, but in the last week I've really learned that it doesn't matter what the distraction is from God, God will remove that distraction so that he can be first and foremost in our lives. And there is nothing in this world that we should be focused on more than our Lord and Savior. He has taken us through trials. He's taken people through addictions. He's taken people through so many times in their lives. I don't know how the world does it without the peace of God and the grace and the mercy. So I pray that for you today. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, please reach out to Pastor Dwayne or someone from the church because there is nothing more that we want than to lead people to Christ. This is a church that wants to equip and lead people. And so if you need anything, please reach out.
We thank you that in the midst of wherever we're at, whether we're in the valley or on the mountaintop, God, just saying the name of Jesus, speaking it, God, brings us so much strength and courage and power and peace. God, we thank you for your grace and mercy. Lord, we praise you for all that you do every second of every day. Lord, sometimes we get so focused on other things, God, that we don't even, we don't even see, we know you're there. God, I just pray that we know, that we know that we are walking hand in hand with the Lord of this universe. That God, we are privileged to be your children. I pray blessings on anyone, God, and everyone who seeks you, who needs you. Lord, help us. Thank you, Jesus, for this beautiful, beautiful, gorgeous day that you've given us. And Jesus, there is something about that day. In the precious name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
We're still being socially distanced, and usually I'll come up here before uh, they start coming down, so as not to have uh, kind of dead dead time. But we're trying to be responsible, so uh, you have a little bit of dead time there. Hopefully, you finish in prayer. Uh, <laughs> it always feels a little anticlimactic for me to come up here um, after. Uh, a worship set like that because I feel like we've already been in the presence of God and we truly don't need the message. Mm, we need uh, but I did work on it all week, so we're going to do it. I, need I didn't it. want you guys to. I need it. it. Could not. <laughs> I will do it for faith. Yeah. It, so. uh, I am really glad that you guys are all uh, here this morning. Some of you here in, in person, some of you uh, are watching. Uh, online live right now and there's other of you that are going to be watching this a little bit later uh, either today or not. Uh, so glad that God gives us uh, the opportunity to live in an age where the technology that we can reach so many people and that we can worship together. Because we always don't do things in a normal way at Kernville Bible Church. 
because we are a river church. Um, <laughs> our last message in the series of witnesses of Acts is actually not even going to be in the book of Acts at all. Uh, we're going to be in the book of First John, not to be confused with the Gospel of John, or Second or Third John. Uh, you can find First John towards the back of your Bible, just a, a few books uh, from the end. Besides his Gospel in John 1, 2, and 3, John also wrote the book of Revelation. And for many people, uh, the writings of John are their absolute favorites in the Bible. Millions of copies of John's Gospel have been printed and distributed worldwide. Because of what John wrote, his writings are used a lot in evangelism, as well as for discipleship and, and Christian growth. And when people come to Jesus, the Gospel of John is often the, the place where they are directed to start reading the Bible. It's my favorite Gospel, and I've read it many times and have led quite a few Bible studies uh, through it. One of the reasons for the popularity of John's writings is because it covers so much that we need to know about our lives as believers. Uh, in his gospel, he shares the life of Jesus. And in his writings in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he writes about how we can live with assurance of salvation. And in Revelation, he reveals God's prophetic plan for the end times. In all of his writings, there is one thing that comes shining through, and that's love. The love of God for us the love of Jesus towards people and his great love for us that he was willingly went to the cross in our place. John also talks a lot about the importance of showing love towards each other. Love flows through John's witnessing. Now don't misunderstand John's writing. He was not touch, uh, talking about a touchy-feely run, run, run around the field with flowers in your head kind of uh, love. And he's not talking about the, ah, oh, gosh, stars in your eye kind of love. The love that John wrote about was not the, oh, don't worry about it. Let's just let everyone do whatever they want. And let's not say anything because we don't want to offend anybody kind of love. The love that John wrote about was real and it was based in truth. And when you genuinely love someone, if you see them doing something that you know is wrong or it's going to hurt them, you say something. You tell them the truth, right. hopefully in a loving way, but the truth nonetheless. John didn't sugarcoat what Jesus said or what he did. Remember, John is the one that, that quoted Jesus as saying in John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. That's pretty direct. Right. And there's nothing wishy-washy about that statement. Truth wrapped in love. In our series, we've looked at real, actual people in the Bible who've made a difference through their witnessing. And today we're going to look at love and see the kind of love that you and I are blessed to experience. As a disciple, John was a, an eyewitness of God's love in all of its forms. He was a witness who got to experience God's love close up and personal. That love so changed him that he dropped everything that he was going to do to follow Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus' love changed him. And John teaches us about who we are in God's love, but he didn't stop there. He also teaches us that part of being God's reflection to the world Part of being the salt and light to the world is that our purpose is to share the love of God with people. When we allow God's love to take over, it moves us to go and make disciples. In other words, to be witnesses for him. Think about your own life. Remember how somebody was praying for you. Somebody who stepped out and shared Jesus with you. Somebody who taught you about the love of God. Well, we're going to get into our passage today by looking at 1 John 3, starting in verse 1, where we're going to see that John witnessed about God's love for us. And I'm actually going to turn there now instead of when I should have. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. See, John was first introduced to Jesus while he was working. 
And you can find that story in, in Matthew 4, 21 and 22. But listen to what it says. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in a boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called to them. And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. See, there was something special about that call of love uh, that John just couldn't resist. And when Jesus called him to be one of his followers, one of his disciples, to be one of his witnesses, John and his brother James left their father, they left their job, they left everything behind to follow Jesus. When we accept God's love for us, we have to spread it. We have to share it, and we have to live it every step of the way. It takes us coming to that place of understanding about what Jesus did for us, and then to continue to be growing in God's love so that we can share that with others and be an example of the love of God. See, John learned a lot about love, true love, unconditional love, while following Jesus. He also learned to love no matter the situation. Listen to Luke 9, 51 through 56 in the Good News Translation. As the time drew near when Jesus would be taken up to heaven, he made up his mind and set out on his way to Jerusalem. He sent messengers ahead of him who went to a village in Samaria to get everything ready for him. But the people there would not receive him because it was clear that he was on his way to Jerusalem. And when the disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? And Jesus turned and rebuked them. And then Jesus said, and his disciples uh, went on to another village. See, John was so upset that this village was rejecting Jesus that he was ready to call down fire and destroy the whole city. First of all, if that's what Jesus had really wanted to do, he really didn't need James and John's help to do that. He could have done it himself. But instead, Jesus showed John they had to love even those who didn't accept him. Good lesson for us to learn as well. See, John also got to see Jesus' love for a Samaritan woman who was not living a life that glorified God. In John 4, 1 through 30, you can read the story about Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. John saw Jesus loving a woman who most Jewish men would have avoided. And she was so disliked that even her own people shunned her. John also witnessed the scene where a woman who was accused of adultery was brought before Jesus. He saw that, that love means forgiveness. And it's not only, and that forgiveness is not only possible, but part of a real love. And you can find this event in John 8, 1 through 12. But watching Jesus, John saw God's love in action. It shaped who he was and who he was going to become. And that love shaped his dealings with people. It shaped his teaching. It shaped his writing. He became the disciple of love. If we look a few verses later at uh, verse 14, uh, we're going to see in our next point where uh, John witnessed about our love for others. So let's go to verses 14 through 18. We know that, that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whosoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in needs and closes his heart against them, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. These uh, verses can sound a little morbid, talking about murder and death. And, but if we look at them in a little different way, that can be actually very uplifting. John is witnessing to the fact that as believers, our very salvation is evidenced in our love. The way we love is a mark of salvation that's unmistakable. And here's the proof. We cannot love God and hate our brothers and sisters in Christ. This passage contains very strong words, for example, but a person who has no love is still dead, or anyone who hates another brother or sister is really a murderer. 
We can know all about the people in the Bible, all the stories and all the facts of the gospel. And we can memorize a lot of verses, but still be spiritually dead. Our spiritual temperature is revealed on the thermometer of love. Let me say that another way. We can tell where our relationship with God is by how much we love others. As believers, we are filled not just to the brim, but to overflowing with God's love. So full that we need to let it overflow onto others. Listen to Romans 5, 5 out of the Good News Version. This hope does not disappoint us, for God has poured out his love into our hearts by means of the Holy Spirit, who is God's gift to us. Hebrews 10, 16 in the New Living Translation goes like this. This is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my, my laws in their heart, and I will write them on their minds. This new covenant that he's talking about here is the love of God. Jesus is moving us past trying to love on our own because he gives us the divine love that makes all the difference. That the divine love comes into us at the moment we believe in the form of the Holy Spirit. John says that our love for other believers is measured by our kindness to them. And kindness seems like a small word, but it's very deep and it's very powerful. Kindness to others means being willing to lay down our lives for them. Now how often in today's world are we going to be called on at least in America, to give our lives up for another believer. I hope not very often. And as I said that, I began thinking that technically, we can only give our lives up one time, and after that, we're hanging out with Jesus. But I think that, that John is saying more that we, than we are to die for a brother if needed. I think John also means that we are to be there for each other, pray for each other, help each other, giving everything we are to be to, to a brother and sister in need. Time, finances, labor, when they are in need, we are to help them from the resources that we have. Amen. Selfishness is the opposite of love. If we look at 1 Corinthians 13, we can see the importance of love and what love really is. This passage is, is read a lot at, at weddings, but it, it applies to, to every believer, not just those who are getting, getting married. And I want to uh, turn to that uh, real quickly. So that'd be 1 Corinthians 13. We're going to look at the first eight verses. And I, I didn't mark it, so I have to turn to it quickly. If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I'm nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. If you look at that list of things uh, there that, we, that just describe what love is, you'll see that each of them are in actions, an action. They're not a feelings, they're actions. We might have feelings of being in love, but real love are actions that come from love. So when we show other believers that it's through our actions, uh, just as God's love was shown to us by the action of sending his son to take our place, Jesus' love is shown by going willingly to the cross. And we show love to each other by being willing to sacrifice our wants and our needs for theirs. If you flip over a, a few pages to chapter 4 in verse uh, 9 through 10, we're going to get to our last point this morning. And in this passage, we're going to see that John witnessed about the greatest example of love. So that's uh, John, 1 John 4, 7 through 10. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. 
The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. Mm -hmm. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation of our sins. We're talking about that power that we are given when we come to Jesus. Did you know you have a special power, kind of like a, a superpower? See, we're given the power to love each other because God chose to love us first. We have to choose to distribute that love, to give that love, to share that love with other people. And this love that John witnessed about is a love that we need to share with others. And it should overflow out of us through the Holy Spirit. And what's really cool about this shared love is that it's a love that's unforced. Nobody has to make us love. We love because of the love that's in us. It's unforced. It's part of who we become when we become believers. This love is also spontaneous. It's the first thing that comes from us as brand new believers because that love that came to us from God in our forgiveness and our salvation. It's also unconditional. And I'm glad that God doesn't love me according to what I deserve or even uh, by how much I love other people. He loves me because of who I am. He loves you because of who you are. And that's why he sent Jesus. He loved us just as we were. But because of our sin, he sent Jesus to take that punishment for those sins so that he could have a relationship with us because he loved us. Mm -hmm. The greatest example of God's love is the cross. John, the disciple of love, had stood at the foot of the cross watching God in human form dying for him, dying for you and me. His love for us caused him to offer a solution to our problem of sin. We receive forgiveness and salvation because of what Jesus did on the cross. God loves to express himself in the forever. Our salvation is not just for now. It's not just a one and done. It's for all time forever. Jesus doesn't overlook sin. He doesn't condone sin. He doesn't excuse sin. But because he loved us, he, he claimed the penalty of sin and, and by his sacrifice on the cross. Even on the cross, Jesus was teaching John about love. John saw, saw him lovingly bring salvation and forgiveness to one of the thieves being crucified with him. He saw love when he watched Jesus ask for forgiveness for those who were killing him. He saw love when in the midst of his own agony, he provided for his mother in commissioning John to care for her as a loving, caring son would do. He saw that Jesus loved him and had work for him to do. Listen to what Jesus said in, in John 19, uh, 25 through 27. Now beside the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister Mary, and the, uh, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. So when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. John wrote what is probably the most well-known verse in the Bible, John 3.16. Verse 9 in our, in our passage seems to echo John 3.16. John knew that the message of the cross is the message of salvation. And then verse 10 tells us that God's love is demonstrated in the death of his son for us. John's very clear that our love for Jesus is where our salvation lies. Instead, it lies in the truth that God first loved us and sent Jesus as a sacrifice to take away our sin. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 5.8, a verse that goes along with these verses of John, but God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. John is trying here to help us understand the power in the love of Jesus. We are to love everyone as Jesus loves us. What's so amazing about God's love is that he loves everyone the same. Everyone is loved the same. Amen. How much better off would we be in this world if we could all get to the place where we loved everyone the same? 
It would make a difference in who we are. It would make a difference in our influence as well. 1 John 3.11 says, For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we are to love one another. Jesus is teaching us in these verses this morning that we cannot live as a believer without this love that he's given to us. Remember when we were talking about our spiritual temperature, how it's revealed on our thermometer of love? I hope that we each have the courage to check out our love thermometer to see where our relationship with God is. Verse 18 reminds us of what we read in 1 Corinthians 13, that, uh, those verses that we looked at earlier, and how the description of love is action. Listen to verse 18 one more time. Little children, let's not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. A believer's love should go way beyond words or what we say. We need to become, as James 1.22 says in the New Living Translation, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. The same is true when it comes to us loving others. We need to be doers of the love that's already in us, sharing it with other people. It should be a real outpouring from the love that's in our hearts. No message, no lesson is complete without some sort of application. And I don't want you to walk away from today's message thinking, oh, if only the pastor had given us some sort of way to apply the message to our lives. I'm so disappointed that he didn't do that. I hate to disappoint people, so we're going to look at how to apply this to our lives this morning. I have always found that one of the best ways to find uh, that I found to apply something is to ask myself questions. And I'm going to share with you some of the questions I've asked myself um, as I prepared uh, the message this week. What have I done to show love to somebody else this past week? If you have to think really hard on the answer, maybe you need to work on showing love a little bit more. I know I do too. We are called to be witnesses of love by showing that love to others. The second question I ask myself and I'm asking you this morning is this. Does the love of God motivate and empower me to be his witness? In other words, am I trying to do this love thing on my own, on my own power? Or am I allowing the Holy Spirit to just let God's love overflow onto those around me? The next question is this. Are we witnessing uh, of love by directing people to the greatest example of God's love? Are we loving people by telling them about what Jesus did for each of, the, uh, each of us on the cross? And then the final question I want us to ask ourselves is this. Am I a witness to love? Am I witnessing about God's love towards all of us, sharing the greatness of God's love? Am I showing it on my face, in my attitude? We need to let God teach us more about his love. A love that's unconditional. It's a love that we are totally unworthy and undeserving of receiving. But because he loved us so much, he chose us to know him, to have a relationship with him, to learn more about him. We can't be who we need to be without, coming to, uh, without love coming to the front, without love moving us and motivating us. We need God to teach us to love like he loves us. We need to put everything else to the side and allow his love to flow in us, through us, and from us. Sometimes we can even be guilty of taking God's love for granted. We need to be amazed and humbled that he loved us enough to send his son for us. We can't take this love for granted. We can't become so used to it that we become jaded. One of my favorite passages is from Psalms 143, 8 through 10. It goes like this. Let me hear your faithfulness in the morning, for I trust in you. Teach me the way in which I should walk, for to you I lift up my soul. Save me, Lord, from my enemies. I take refuge in you. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. And I have these verses printed on a couple cards that I used to have around uh, in my files in the gift store office uh, at camp when I worked down there, and Vicki actually printed them up and laminated it for me. And I have it on my mirror in the bathroom so I could read those words every morning and pray them back to God. Or at least that was the plan. 
I've gotten so used to that laminated sheet of paper being on my mirror that most mornings I don't even see it anymore. I love that passage, and I want to pray it back to God each morning. But I've gotten to the point of where it's so familiar that I don't even notice it anymore. I don't want to ever get that way with God's love. I don't want to get so used to the amazing, unbelievable, unconditional love that God has for me that I begin to not even notice it. I want to be just blown away every day that the God who created the universe, the God who spoke all things into existence, loves me. Amen. One of the ways I can keep that from happening is to always be thankful. Mm -hmm. To spend time each day thanking him for his love, for choosing to love me, even with all my problems and my mess-ups. A word we don't use a lot anymore, but I think is a good one to describe this word is awe. And the best definition I found online was this. Awe is the, uh, is the, defin the, let me start again. the definition of awe is a strong feeling of respect or amazement brought on by something that is beautiful or sacred. That's what I want. I want to be in awe of God every day, every minute. I want to be in awe of him because of who he is, what he's done, and most of all, because he is worthy. I don't know where any of you are in your relationship with God this morning, where you are in, in showing love. But if you realize this morning that you need to be more of a witness of love, then go to God today, this morning, right now, and put all those things that are keeping you from being a witness of love at the foot of the throne and leave them. If you're making this commitment this morning and you want us to be praying for you and coming alongside you, contact us and we'll be praying for you. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you've never experienced the love that God has given to you, I want to challenge you to let go of all the things that you're holding on to. Things that don't truly satisfy your soul and grab on to Jesus who can we were created to be in a relationship with God, but sin has made that impossible. Romans 5, 8 says in the New Living Translation, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. He loves you enough to let his only son be a substitute in your place. If you want to receive this gift of forgiveness and salvation offered to you through Jesus, contact us and we would love to try and answer any questions that you might have and show you how you can have a relationship with the God of love. God's love. God's love for us. God's love to us. God's love through us. We are to be witnesses to God's love to those around us. Whatever God has put on your heart today, please respond as he leads, may God have his way in each of our lives this morning. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, right now we just ask that uh, you let us examine our lives, examine our hearts to get to know uh, where we are with you, Lord. How are we witnessing through love? Lord, are we sharing you? Are we sharing what you've done? Are we sharing what we have with each other? Are we taking care of those around us? Lord, we just want to be in your will. We want to, to just be in all of you. Lord, we just ask that right now you examine our hearts. Lord, that you uh, just dig through all the the, the dirt and the uh, things that, that don't really matter, Lord, so that we can come right to the heart of the matter. Are we loving the way you want us to love? And Lord, if we're not that, Lord, I pray that you give us the courage to change that, to do what we need to do in our lives, to, to rid our, our, our lives of the things that is holding us back from doing that. And that takes courage. Lord, we want you to be in control. We want you the only thing that we worship. We pray all this in your name.
from Psalms 90, verses 16 and 17. Let your work appear to your servants and your majesty to their children. May the kindness of the Lord our God be upon us and confirm for us the work of your hands. Yes, confirm the work of our hands. 